member of the Medhaw Valley community. This meeting is being recorded. Have uh, Sorry. No, that's okay. I got it. Um, I lived here uh, for uh, nine or ten years. I uh, came out to practice after I finished uh, residency and just f have found this to be such a wonderful place to live. Uh, have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and I'm really enjoying uh, watching my boys grow up in this community and enjoy uh, the opportunity now to practice uh, for family health centers in TWISP. So see patients there as a family physician two days a week. And then in the middle of COVID, thought it'd be a good idea to become the public health officer. And uh, so started doing that in 2021, um, but was already you know deep in the trenches with it prior to that, working at the hospital and working with family health centers. And um, so uh, I, I really enjoy the work that I do and love opportunities to share a little bit of it. Um, and I also love to be interrupted with questions. Uh, I want to, Selena, if you want to watch the chat and see if anybody uses that, let me know. Stop me. Um, and I, uh, I can go for a long time talking about a lot of these things, but put together some slides to try and tr structure my uh, discussion, but uh, help me take it into more, more pertinent territory uh, if you want to. Um, what I thought I would do is just give a really uh, uh, broad review of uh, COVID-19 um, in our county and how it's impacted us. Um, hopefully that's not uh, uh, reliving trauma for anybody, but it, uh, it's nice to see where we've come uh, in public health. Talk about a little, talk a little bit about the challenges, especially of delayed care and access barriers that we started to experience with COVID and continue to, to struggle with. Talk about some current public health areas of interest and then uh, talk to you all a little bit about our upcoming community health assessment and the role you guys could play uh, to help us with that. Um, so while it's crazy to think that we have been at this for three years now, but uh, you know it was right around this time where Washington was seeing its first uh, COVID cases and um, we were a little bit late to the game. Uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't see as many cases as Western Washington did initially. Um, and we were all thankful of that, but uh, we really didn't start ramping up our efforts and our knowledge and understanding of how to combat the, uh, the illness or the public health ramifications of it until well into the summertime and uh, are still improving our our uh, efforts but uh, we really got hit hard first in the summer of 2020. Um, I was practicing primarily in Brewster at that point in time and the Brewster community uh, was really hit hard um, uh, especially our agricultural workers and folks that live in tight housing uh, don't have as many options and didn't have as much access to uh, information about how to protect themselves and their families. And so we saw a huge spike uh, specifically in our Spanish speaking population with that first surge. And it certainly lasted a long, much longer than any of us thought it would. I was uh, hunkered down and prepared for three months of COVID and uh, here we are now at three years. Um, but fortunately in the fall of 2020, we saw a decline um, are you guys still able to see the screen? It's uh, breaking up a little bit for me. Yeah. Um, fortunately, in the fall, saw a decline in those uh, early high cases, and um, we were able to kind of lick our wounds and talk a little bit more about strategies, standardized treatments uh, for hospitalized patients, as well as um, have a better understanding of how to prevent COVID with non-pharmaceutical interventions like masking and distancing and engaging in public activities in a safe way, although we were all still very much isolated socially uh, in the fall of 2020. Uh, we also started hearing about uh, the emergence of the vaccine in fall of 2020. And so I, um, I will say I was one of the first vaccine skeptics um, because when I heard about new technology, I uh, was not familiar with it. And so uh, has a, had a lot of hesitation early on and did a lot of deep dives into 
the existing research, existing reports, and uh, found it really helpful to talk to experts and talk to physicians who had more experience in immunology and uh, and the design and development of vaccines and started working more with the health department, our health officer at the time and other health officials to learn as much as I could about the vaccine. So that when it was available to us in December of uh, 2020, um, I, I was certainly ready for it and um, uh, welcomed it and certainly promoted it for my patients. And, uh, and as we slowly worked through, if anyone remembers that slow, uh, um, uh, process of getting the vaccine, uh, out and available to more and more, uh, segments of the population, starting with the highest risk individuals. And then by the spring of 2021, making it available to, um, uh, everyone 16 years of age and older. Um, around that time, we saw the first of the variants. So the B117 variant or the alpha variant emerged uh, first in the UK and then hit the United States in December, January, uh, January of 2021, and led that uh, winter 2021 surge uh, that wasn't quite as severe in Okanagan County as, as the previous summer but certainly hit a lot of people, uh, resulted in a lot of hospitalizations and helped us to realize this, uh, you know, wasn't going to be a one and done surge that uh, was over with and something that we were, we would be contending with, uh, for a long time. Um, we had a little bit of an increase with, uh, a couple other variants in the spring and early summer of 2021. Um, but really, by the summer of 2021, we felt like maybe this is dying out. Maybe the disease has run its course and uh, Washington State uh, reopened. A lot of events were held again. Um, and uh, we felt like between um, the virus naturally dying out, people taking protective measures, uh, some people having immunity uh, from previous illness, and then a lot more people being vaccinated, uh, we were in a much safer spot. And then all of a sudden Delta hit and Delta was the most uh, most contagious variant we had seen and uh, certainly the most uh, severe as far as deaths and uh, hospitalizations. And that lasted longer and really had a greater impact in Eastern Washington um, than, uh, than Western Washington led to more hospitalizations uh, um, per capita and uh, as a proportion of the people that were uh, affected with COVID. And it was the first time we saw our healthcare systems really struggling and difficulty in getting patients down to Central Washington Hospital or transferred out. And it was a time where Mid Valley Hospital, where I had started working at the time and North Valley Hospital, Three Rivers were all stretched really beyond capacity and uh, struggling with their ability to take care of sick COVID patients, but also their ability to take care of patients uh, in general for whatever reason they needed to be hospitalized. Um, fortunately, that surge uh, declined by the winter of 2021-2022, uh, and uh, we had a little bit of a lull in the action until Omicron hit, and Omicron hit us uh, we watched it come from South Africa, uh, Europe, and then hit the eastern United States in December of 2022. We braced for it. We knew it was coming. We were as ready as we could be, but we were not prepared for the number of cases that we saw. And uh, here on this graph, you can see that you know it almost doubled uh, the number of cases that we saw with Delta or that we had seen any one time in the pandemic. Um, it was much more contagious, spread much more rapidly. Fortunately, it was not as severe, so the relative number of hospitalizations were not what we feared because we were scared of how overwhelmed we were uh, during Delta. Um, and while we prepared as well as we could, we fortunately didn't have to face as much uh, shortage in, uh, with healthcare capacity as we did with Delta. Um, still had an overwhelming uh, experience with that and uh, very fortunately saw it uh, drop down in March uh, and April of 2022. Uh, and then the B uh, 
BA4, BA5 variants came through last summer um, were not uh, as bad as the original Omicron variant, um, but certainly led to a lot of uh, hospitalizations. And since that point in time, we've been a, in a slow downtrend. We still have cases. There are a number of cases in the community right now. Um, we're seeing uh, actually more hospitalizations over the past two or three weeks than we have uh, over the past two to three months. So we're watching that very closely. Um, the uh, BX, uh, BXX 1.5 is the predominant variant right now. Each one is more contagious, but this one's no more severe than previous ones. Um, it's just uh, uh, our current, uh, current variant, and we're watching those closely and hoping that none become as severe as, as prior, uh, prior variants. Um, in Okanagan County, uh, you know, we saw um, similar impacts, uh, but some unique to our area. As I mentioned, those early surges hit our Spanish speaking community um, uh, at a greater rate uh, than other ethnicities. So this graph on the top, um, if you can read through all those lines, the red line is the case rate uh, in our Spanish speaking or Hispanic population. And in both, um, in both surges during that first year, uh, we saw many, many more cases uh, among Hispanic folks in uh, Okanagan County and North Central Washington, um, hitting migrant communities, farm worker camps, uh, tight housing, um, overcrowded housing, especially in that first uh, surge was uh, a reason for that as well as our, our inability to communicate as effectively as we wanted to um, with that population. Um, and over time, uh, we've learned uh, to use unique uh, sources, community health workers, uh, outreach specialists, folks that uh, know communities well, speak the same language, understand customs and cultures, and can communicate better. And then using our uh, healthcare partners and community partners that work most closely with underrepresented groups really enables us to get communication right, um, to identify gaps in resources um, and overcome some of those uh, barriers that exist. So I think we've done a good job at that, but we can always uh, find better ways to do that. That uh, disproportionate impact of COVID no longer exists with the Hispanic population. And in fact, the Hispanic population uh, has higher vaccination rates in North Central Washington um, than other ethnicities, including uh, white folks. And um, it's uh, because of the good work many of our community partners have put into place um, to ensure uh, uh, good understanding, good communication. Um, uh, age has certainly been a, a factor all along, um, earlier on, and then now uh, folks who are older than 65 years of age um, have more severe disease, more likely to be hospitalized, and uh, especially those with health comorbidities are much more vulnerable, and we need to continue to take extra efforts to protect uh, uh, folks of older age um, and with uh, respiratory illnesses and uh, cardiac illnesses, um, even as we move forward with, with lower rates. Um, a pervasive challenge for us is continued access uh, to um, healthcare services in general, um, but specifically uh, routine care and preventive care, um, because early on we had shut down a lot, a lot of the routine healthcare access uh, to preserve access during those surges or to prevent illness from spreading within clinics or healthcare facilities and keeping folks safe. And oftentimes the safest place was at home. That took a toll and, uh, and we're still recovering um, from those limitations. I think one thing to celebrate is uh, the collaboration that spawned through all the stress in the healthcare system. Uh, the three hospitals in Okanagan County are now working together more than at any point in time that I've been out here uh, in a collaboration with public health and between Mid Valley Hospital, Three Rivers Hospital um, and North Valley Hospital is just something that we're really happy about, proud of, and I think it's going to lead us to make further improvements in healthcare systems 
um, as we move forward. And then public health has really been strengthened. We've recognize that uh, you know no one was prepared for this pandemic and public health is you know the necessary lead uh, in addressing the pandemic um, had for a long time been understaffed under resourced and uh, we're gaining additional funding to do a better job at the basics nuts and bolts of public health which is assessment uh, knowing communities well intervening where necessary to make uh, access to health, healthy resources and healthcare services more equitable across the populations that we serve. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of that work uh, as I close. Um, so uh, chronic disease management certainly uh, took a hit. There were many more exacerbations of chronic illnesses and limited access to care for people with chronic illness during the height of the pandemic. Um, and then uh, behavioral health as well, uh, not just because uh, access to services was limited, but also because this was a very stressful experience for us all. Uh, this graph shows the increase in emergency room visits uh, for uh, attempted suicide in youth uh, really peaked in uh, late 2020, early 2021. Um, youth were much more socially isolated. The normal activities of going to school, engaging in sports, things that are the routine part of the life of uh, youngsters in our population was not available. And so, you know, we're still digging out of that, fortunately, or not seeing the, um, uh, the suicide rates or the access for healthcare services because of psychological distress. Um, and we've learned a lot in this experience, um, but have a long way to go in, in finding ways to uh, support uh, behavioral health of the whole population um, and youth as well um, as we move forward um, with behavioral health as a, a per pervasive access challenge. Um, we saw an increased rate in opioids and op opioid overdoses because of lack of access to some basic really helpful services for folks that are dependent on opioids. We also saw an increase in sexually transmitted diseases. Our syphilis rate rose tremendously during 2020 and 2021, and we're just catching up really on recognizing uh, how bad that uh, illness is spread throughout the community. And uh, as we develop better resources and play catch up, um, our work in uh, reducing STD rates um, is, uh, is a big challenge for us. Um, immunizations fell by the wayside um, as um, routine care, especially for kids, but for adults as well, um, was not as available. And so uh, we've got some work to do to help folks catch up on immunizations. Um, Betsy asked that I share a little bit about that, about what immunizations are available and recommended for adults uh, at this point in time. Certainly the COVID vaccine, um, up to date with COVID vaccination, uh, now means completing the primary series, which uh, for the mRNA vaccines is two doses of uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. And then, uh, then when available, at least two months after the, that initial primary series or two months after your most recent booster, go ahead and get the bivalent mRNA booster, uh, which has been out since October and uh, is still uh, showing efficacy and reducing transmission, but more importantly, reducing severe illness um, in comparison to people that have not been vaccinated. Um, there are also antigen-based vaccines. Uh, the Novavax um, and Janssen vaccines are available. They're not quite as effective, but for folks that don't want the mRNA vaccine, they are available. Um, we still recommend influenza vaccine each year. Uh, there are several different uh, formulations. The one that we use at Family Health Centers um, and that has been pretty effective this year is the quadrivalent. That means four different types of flu strain uh, in one vaccine uh, recommended uh, in October or around the start of the flu season. And then for folks that are 65 years of age and older, um, getting the high dose formula uh, formulation of that influenza vaccine, that's more effective in folks. Uh, both to prevent uh, illness as well as prevent severe um, illness and hospitalization. 
There's been a little bit of a change in the past two years in the pneumonia vaccine. It's something that's always been available, um, but that they continue to perfect and improve. Um, so the Prevnar or PCV vaccine initially had 13 strains um, of uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, what, the most common form of uh, uh, bacteria that causes pneumonia, um, but uh, focused on uh, a lot of childhood pneumonia, uh, causes of pneumonia. Um, that's been expanded to include uh, strains of pneumonia that affect, affect adults as well. And then the um, Pneumovax or PPSV23 has always been available for adults um, and was initially given to folks uh, with chronic disease or immune deficiency. Um, and then once folks hit 65 years of age and older, we continue to give that uh, for folks that have gotten PCV13 or PCV15 in the past. Um, but now the newest version of the pneumonia vaccine, the PCV20, um, is highly recommended because it kind of does the job of both vaccines. So folks that haven't had a pneumonia vaccine uh, right now, we're uh, recommending the PCV20. But for folks that have had uh, PCV13, all you need is the PPSV23. Or folks that have had the PPSV23 previously, just need one dose of the PCV20. Very complicated, hard to keep straight. I keep a cheat sheet in my office um, and most healthcare providers do. And uh, um, I'm, I know that folks at family health centers, but I think all healthcare providers are pretty up to date on this and can advise you which one uh, is most appropriate for you. Uh, the shingles vaccine is a huge help in preventing shingles and preventing that post herpetic neuralgia, the nerve pain that can last for six months or more after a case of shingles. Um, a lot of people got the original shingles vaccine, the Zostavax that was offered up until about four years ago. That was pretty good, but the new one is even better and the new one even works for folks that have had that Zostavax in the past. And so we're recommending that you know all folks over 60 years of age or folks that are over 50 years of age who have an illness that compromises their immune system, go ahead and get that uh, new shingles vaccine. It's uh, two doses, one month apart, and is usually available through pharmacies and can be administered through a pharmacy or through uh, your healthcare provider. And then tetanus and pertussis, um, you know, has been one that has been available. It's part of the childhood vaccine series and, um, you know, I just, I would feel horrible if any of my patients stepped on a rusty nail and got tetanus. It's not treatable once you get it. Um, and so prevention is the best way to, uh, to avoid a, uh, sorry, a tetanus uh, infection. And pertussis has waning immunity uh, over a lifetime. So we recommend that everybody get one dose of the pertussis vaccine that's mixed with the tetanus vaccine during adulthood, and then every 10 years get the tetanus vaccine. Let me stop for a second and see if there are uh, any questions. Um, I, oh, okay, great question about tracking now for COVID since there's so much home testing and so little reporting. Um, we're still tracking cases as they're reported, either through people that do a home test and report either through Okanagan County Public Health or through the state database. You can go to Okanagan County Public Health for information on how to report uh, your home test, or you can ask that your healthcare provider do that for you. Um, healthcare providers, both labs and the rapid tests in clinics, are reported to public health. Uh, through several different reporting platforms. But you're exactly right. Tons of people are getting COVID. Some aren't even getting tested. They just know they have it and they uh, um, either call in and let us know um, or don't let healthcare providers know um, and do well without treatment um, and don't report it. So it's hard to track cases. I think we've reached a steady state right now where that access to testing is not changing a whole lot, at least it hasn't for the past two to three months. And so while we're not capturing all the, all the cases, we're following the trends. And right now we can suspect that anywhere from um, 
uh, some people say as low as 12%. I'm seeing more 30 to 40% of cases um, are reported. So if you multiply the number of cases that are being reported by two to three times, that's probably an accurate picture of the number of the cases that are out there in the community. We do pay a little closer attention now to hospitalization because hospitalization doesn't wane um, uh, as much as that uh, the case rates because of that uh, testing bias. Um, and so we're really watching our hospitalization rates. They're a little bit higher, as I said, right now than they were two to three months ago. Um, and we're watching that very carefully. Another really interesting modality for tracking uh, COVID activity is wastewater data. So uh, the public wastewater facility in Brewster and one in Wenatchee are tracking um, the uh, 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 pieces of COVID vaccine that come through wastewater. And so that sampling has gotten consistent enough to where we are, you know, watching those trends to see if there's a spike. And sure enough, in the past um, uh, two to three weeks, we've seen a, seen a pretty big increase in wastewater uh, uh, samples of COVID-19, um, just as we've started to see an increase in cases uh, that have been reported an increase in hospitalizations. Um, and then latest understanding of masking efficacy in various situations at this point. Great, great question. Um, so still there's a graded uh, efficacy of various sorts of face coverings with the N95 or KN95 respirators is providing the most, the best uh, protection for the individual wearing them and also good protection uh, to the people around the person that's wearing the mask. Uh, uh, surgical masks or the medical grade masks that uh, you wear in surgery or wear during procedures um, aren't quite as good as N95s, but they're better than nothing and better than cloth masks. Um, cloth masks don't provide that much uh, protection for yourself while you're wearing them. Um, they can provide some source control. So the person that has COVID may, will be less likely to spread COVID if they're wearing a face covering. Um, but for both reasons, it's not as effective as wearing a surgical mask or, a, or an N95 respirator. If you're concerned uh, about getting COVID or about spreading COVID, I'd really recommend using a surgical mask. And if you have access to N95s or KN95s, um, wear those when you're in public places or in high risk settings um, or at any time when you're out in the public to protect yourself. Um, and then moving on, uh, we regularly do community health assessments. It's a core function of public health. Um, they're done every three to four years regularly, not just by health departments, but also by uh, uh, our local hospitals, as well as um, uh, Family Health Centers does one every two to three years. And it's an assessment of the highest health needs, the prioritized health needs throughout the community. Um, and consistently over time, uh, in Okanagan County, one of the most highly prioritized needs is better access to medical and behavioral health services. We also see pretty consistently housing as a, a huge challenge. I think that's only increasing, I know, especially in the Methow Valley. Uh, transportation in rural areas is a perennial concern. Um, and opioid substance use disorder and opioid overdoses has always been a concern. But that's one thing that's getting a lot of attention right now because we've seen such a rise over the past two to three years. Um, I've tried to fight and, and, and overcome, help patients overcome opioid dependence um, ever since I started practicing and have seen a lot of trends. And, um, you know, early on, we were very much uh, driven by prescription medications and the cause of opioid overdoses being prescribed medications. Um, prescribing practices have improved over the past two decades. Um, there are a lot more resources per, for providers to learn how to safely use pain medications and how to avoid overprescribing or prescribing wrong doses for the wrong people. Um, and so we've seen a decrease in opioid overdoses for prescription drugs, 
but not enough treatment opportunities for people that are dependent on opioids. And so as soon as those prescription drug overdoses went down, we saw heroin start to rise um, as the number one reason for opioid overdoses. Access to heroin has decreased. And so now we're seeing fentanyl and synthetic opi opioids become the predominant reason. Those are so addictive and so potent and so dangerous, oftentimes mixed in with other drugs that overdoses are skyrocketing right now. We've seen just in the first month of uh, 2023, we've seen um, more opioid overdoses in Okanagan County than we have in any month prior, uh, dating back to, I think, 20, uh, 2013, when we started uh, tracking data from this source. Um, it's something that we're going to be really active and working on as with public health and with our healthcare partners. But that we each, each, each sector within the community is going to be able to play a role, and we're going to be doing a lot of uh, a lot of work to engage folks that can ha help us have an impact um, on opioid and substance use disorder. And then I think, uh, unfortunately, we're all becoming aware of the dangers and uh, and difficulties that wildfire smoke um, uh, causes. Uh, almost every year, uh, and um, I'm working with Clean Air Methow and the Okanagan Airshed Partnership, as well as folks in Chelan Douglas counties, uh, to really beef up our efforts to protect really highly vulnerable folks uh, when smoke rolls in, and really to work year-round to decrease um, uh, poor air quality and prepare for the really high-intensity uh, smoke events that we see, um, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, almost every year. Um, other question in the chat, uh, what kind of uptake of the bivalent vaccine have we seen in the area? Still a low number of people, um, lower than I expected. Um, I think we're around 20 to 30 percent of people who are eligible uh, have gotten the bivalent va vaccine. Um, there are several sources of immunity now. So folks that got the primary series and got another booster or two certainly have a level of immunity. People who have previously had uh, COVID have a level of immunity. Um, but the best way to be proactive about um, maximizing your immunity is to uh, get this newest booster. Any booster would help, but this newest booster is uh, the one that's available and, and is proven to be especially effective in reducing hospitalizations and severe illness. Um, the immunity that's provided uh, by getting the illness itself um, definitely lasts about three months, but then starts to wane. Um, and uh, uh, vaccine-mediated immunity wanes as well. And so I think getting boosters uh, every six months, maybe every year, uh, will be a likely uh, likely future for us. Much some very similar to the um, to the influenza vaccine that we get once a year. Um, so uh, in the coming month, or sorry, coming year, uh, Okanagan County Public Health with uh, help from community partners as well as uh, our regional epidemiologists are going to be connect conducting a new community health assessment. Um, our first task is going to be to compile all the community health, health assessments that our various partners have done um, and then engage stakeholders um, through the Coalition for Health Improvement and organizations like MetHow at Home in reviewing the existing uh, reports from community health assessments and then updating our processes for data collection, updating questionnaires, updating interview guides, updating the indicators that we want to count, um, because if we don't count something, we're not going to be able to uh, um, to report on it. Um, so we want input from as broad of an uh, audience or um, as many sectors uh, as possible. And we're not just talking about disease indicators, but we're talking about housing, food security, transportation, access to resources uh, for health, uh, not just health indicators. Um, and then we intend to uh, work with community partners to collect data as broadly as possible throughout the community. We recognize that there are segments of the population in Okanagan County that have been underrepresented, underreported, 
Um, and we want to reach out and get into all the nooks and crannies around Okanagan County to really make sure that we um, we get uh, uh, as as reliable information uh, as possible. And then, in a similar participatory way, we want to report on bring these uh, bring the information that's gathered uh, to groups like uh, MetHow at Home and other community organizations help uh, get their help in prioritizing uh, the findings and then plan our interventions around that. And the idea is to do it in a collaborative way that uh, draws as much input as possible so that we can all work together in, uh, in the interventions and, the, and then the plans that we make uh, following the community health assessment. Um, great question about opioid treatment options in Okanagan County. So um, for opioid treatment, Oftentimes, uh, detox uh, does not need to be done in an inpatient setting. Oftentimes, people do go through detox or, you know, eliminating all opioids from their systems while they're hospitalized or while they're incarcerated or in a, in a setting where they don't have access to um, opioids by any other means. Um, now, in the jail is obviously, as well as in hospitals, we do have prescribers that can uh, prescribe buprenorphine, which is a opioid substitute um, that helps to control the cravings as well as the adverse uh, effects of opioids. And uh, that can be done in a very careful process uh, with the healthcare provider in outpatient setting uh, or in the jail or inpatient setting. Um, and we've had a lot of success, not just in prescribing that medication, but really developing a system and a team of caregivers around the individual so that um, the path towards recovery is much easier. We find that if we can secure housing, make employment a possibility, ensure that food, clothing, basic necessities of life are taken care of, people are much more effective in overcoming their opioid dependence or moving through uh, pathways towards recovery than if they're just given a medication or don't have all those resources at hand. Uh, behavioral health is a big part of that. So we work with Okanagan County Behavioral Health at Family Health Centers. We have behavioral health uh, specialists that work with patients and then care coordinators and case managers um, to really make, uh, to meet all needs and, uh, and help su support folks. One of the biggest breakthroughs and most inspiring group that we're working with now are recovery coaches um, funded by Okanagan County Public Health, Family Health Centers, a group called Advance, and then the North Central Accountable Communities of Health. Um, and the recovery coaches are folks that have worked through the recovery themselves and act as peer, peer coaches, peer guides, and um, understand so many of the unique intricacies of opioid dependence from their own lived experience and their success in working through uh, um, the recovery process that they're able to lend expertise uh, to folks that are just starting down a pathway or re-entering a pathway of recovery. And uh, they're, they're saving lives day in and day out. I've had patients that I've started treatment and they disappear, but the recovery coaches keep track of them. So as soon as they're ready to re-enter treatment, they pick them right back up. And I know that they're preventing uh, overdoses um, and helping, honestly, helping people stay alive. Another thing that they're doing and we're doing is distributing naloxone throughout the community. We even have free vending machines placed at strategic locations around North Central Washington so that People that want to get naloxone to be able to save a friend, save a family member, save themselves um, by sharing that naloxone with somebody else um, can have that readily available. And we have, you know, countless um, numbers of times that those have been used to actually save somebody's life. Um, we've started recording those, recording those as they're associated with overdoses um, and are seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of inspiring stories based on that. Um, and then Medicaid uh, will pay for, uh, Medicaid pays for medications, Medicaid pays for office visits, but Medicaid doesn't pay for all of those wraparound services. So right now um, it's grants and demonstration projects and other funding sources that pay for uh, addressing social determinants of health uh, around opioid use disorder. Um, 
So that will be the process of our community health assessments. And I'll go ahead and kick it off and, you know, let's have a, a, a short conversation about what public health priorities you guys are seeing, what's close to home for MetHow at home. Um, and as we embark on a new process of, uh, of community health assessments, what yeah. questions would we be asking? So I'm gonna stop sharing there. Our cloud video HD video meeting. There we go. I think I stopped sharing, and I'd love to take questions and and hear from you all on uh, what priorities you see in in public health for the Methow Valley, for Okanagan County, North Central Washington. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Speak out. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, we've got a lot of other people, I'm sure, who have thoughts as well. One of the things that with Meadow at Home deals with on a regular basis is um, older adults, particularly living alone with um, a cognitive impairment as they age. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, um, these are extreme, extremely difficult situations and vulnerable older people and the resources is, seem to be limited. <laughs> so are, is this uh, kind of on your radar as a public health crisis of any magnitude or I'm sure it's not yeah. just in the valley. Yeah, it's definitely not just in the valley. And I mean, something that you know, we've worked together on and that I, you know, have patients really uh, struggling with this issue. Um, it's something that's hard to capture. Um, some of our, uh, our epidemiologists, both of whom, or I guess all three of whom have just been hired with uh, new funding, um, and they're able to tap into databases that we previously haven't been able to access. One of which is um, a database that queries uh, healthcare facilities that are participating, that are uploading data, but it takes, um, it definitely takes like ICD-9 codes and procedure codes, but even can query the narrative portion of providers notes um, to look for specific terms. And so they can write queries and then draw uh, from that documentation the number of times people are seeking care for cognitive decline or number of people who have Alzheimer's disease or number of people that are um, uh, facing cognitive challenges uh, throughout the community. And um, that's certainly something that I can talk with our EPI group uh, to see if they can include in this assessment. Another, another issue that came up at last night's discussion is um, uh, gun violence, both self-directed and um, probably primarily self-directed. Uh, um, and I, that seems like a really difficult issue to tackle in our region. Yeah. Yeah. Since guns are so integrated into a lifestyle. Yeah, it's, it's something I counsel on as a physician. Um, it's something that's hard to, um, hard to get good data on, on a community level or a population level. Um, we can certainly track uh, um, attempted and completed suicide rates. And that, uh, that's been a number that we've tracked for a long time. Um, whether or not we can tease that out into, uh, into methods and uh, proportion that are uh, firearm related um, is a good question. And I can explore that. Um, I think I'd love to have a measure that helps us get upstream <laughs> of that and not just count the tip of the iceberg, but uh, helps orient ourselves towards prevention as well. And I think some of the behavioral health indices 
will help to a degree, but specifically with fire, firearms, it'll take more creativity. And as one reason, we'll include a qualitative part to the evaluation, because if we're just looking at numbers, if we're just looking at, uh, at uh, indicators, you miss the stories behind it and you miss a lot of uh, really important information that you can get from uh, from just talking with people, having conversations and then reporting on those conversations. And then human trafficking. Yes, I will say that human trafficking does exist in Okanagan County. I think it's oftentimes uh, closely associated with uh with the drug trade um and that's very hard to capture um very hard to follow um and so we offer uh resources and um try to create space where people can uh, access resources if they do see trafficking or aware of trafficking or they themselves impacted or involved in trafficking um, but it's a really, really difficult problem to, to, to crack and get into. Yeah, great question about reasons for delayed care. Um, certainly a small population living in a large county does, you know, we're, we're geographically uh, isolated in so many ways. So transportation becomes a big issue. Um, you know, Family Health Centers, for instance, has uh, 25 medical providers, but it's spread over six clinics across the entire county. Um, and so, you know, we only, you know, on any given day, we may only have a total of, you know, uh, 24, 48 uh, appointment slots. Um, one thing we've done to overcome that that's really opened up with COVID is telehealth. Um, and so while you might want to come see me and twist, but my uh, schedule is completely booked, you can still call family health centers. And it might be that Dr. Cooley and Brewster has an opening and she can do a telehealth um, appointment. And we've um, we've tried to be creative and, and explored all sorts of different ways to use telehealth, uh, ranging from having one person that does only telehealth to have set telehealth appointment slots throughout everybody's schedule throughout the course of the day. And we've even shuffled telehealth appointments to make more space in person sometimes so that if I have a telehealth appointment, but then somebody walks in and needs to be seen in person, I can pass that telehealth port. Uh, appointment off to another provider. And it's uh, resulted in a lot of flexibility and I think improvements in access. Um, but the bottom line is we don't have enough healthcare providers out here uh, to meet the needs. And, and so we need to continue to, to be creative and then continue to uh, recruit, uh, train and retain uh, as many healthcare providers as we can. And we've got some really good programs up trying to um, trying to develop more training opportunities as well. Um, Betsy, I think you've muted yourself. I'm curious about the syphilis epidemic. I um, think of that as something that we've kind of done pretty well at mastering and now that's not the case so um, yeah is this a can can we understand anything more about how it's uh what's happening in this regard or where yeah. yeah the rates are definitely higher among uh folks with substance use disorder um and uh you know when you're when the majority of your waking hours are spent trying to calm your op opioid receptors or you know manage the stress treat the stress and anxiety that you feel in day-to-day -day life with uh, um, with uh, with substance use you're not as careful with anything else in life including uh, including sex and so there are a lot of folks that uh, aren't as mindful aren't as protected um, and I think it just takes a little bit of a tip um, to 
uh, a level of, uh, I guess, a prevalence um, where it starts cycling through the community and we're cycling up rather than cycling down like we were before. Um, treatment is still there. Penicillin is still very effective at syphilis um, and I think always will be. Um, but uh, we also find that we need to improve our systems in uh, case management and really doing good outreach to let people know that it's a, a serious illness that is on the rise and so that you need to get tested. We're screening more frequently now. And we're so part of it, I think, is that we've recognized that it's a problem. And so we're screening more. We're detecting more cases. And so the case numbers are going up which it's good that we're detecting cases, but uh, we need to treat it and ensure treatment um, success and treat partners and treat networks um, so that one treated case doesn't become a, a reinfection. You, you mentioned, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dave. Oh, I was just going to wonder if there's any hope of any sort of in-home health care, especially for elders that are mostly housebound. It can be really difficult getting to the clinic, even just for a booster shot. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So, you know, their home health organizations inhabit as the most recent name for uh, uh, for what was Encompass and before that uh, Frontier. Frontier. Yeah, um, but they're understaffed um, and they um, have to limit their services because of their limited staff capacity. I'd love to hire and train more folks to be home health nurses, provide those services. Um, you know, we've tried at family health centers, we've tried to find a way to do home visits, um, but um, haven't, haven't gotten there yet. Uh, we definitely may need many more providers and uh, more creative solutions to be able to make that a possibility. We do, in the middle of the pandemic, bought a mobile unit, haven't used that uh, as, uh, as much as we'd like to. Um, so that's going to be an option, uh, at least for getting, uh, you know, um, up to up to Mazama or uh, over to Loomis or up into the Indianus Valley. Those like far flung places that uh, are really a challenge to uh, to come from uh, to get health care. Um, but unfortunately, with all that's been going on, we haven't gotten there yet. I guess I have one other question that, that about the funding of public health in the county. And uh, I think it, I believe that this budget really comes through the county, our county commissioners. Is that correct? Um, in part, it does. So we get uh, county funds. We also um, have secured the Washington legislature. Have, uh, uh, Wasalfa, the Washington State Association for Public Health, local public health officials has advocated for a long time uh, for funding to go directly to local health jurisdictions. Um, and so more recently that's been split. So less going to Department of Health and more uh, going to local health jurisdictions um, uh, under a program called Foundational Public Health Services. Um, and so those funds come earmarked for different uh, foundational public health services. And that's what's going to fund our community health assessment, funding our epidemiologists. That's going to fund um, better public health related uh, emergency preparedness and disaster planning. Um, so a lot of our wildfire work is going to go come from that funding source. Um, and then just building 
building the foundation of a strong health department. We've lost a lot of that. Uh, John McCarthy was the uh, was the former uh, health officer before me, and he started in 20, 2002. Um, and he said they built up, built up, and then around 2007, 2008, funding just started getting cut, and they went from having, I think, 32 uh, FTEs at public health down to having eight um, at the start of the pandemic. And, um, you know, we're probably, I think we're to 10 now, but we need probably two or three times as many people in public health to really accomplish what we hope to. We've got just a few minutes left. If there are any uh, burning questions for Dr. Wallace, please, we invite you in to speak up. I really appreciate the question about uh, services for folks that are homebound. I, that's the population that you guys serve. I, I can't thank you enough for the work that you do to my for my patients. Um, and I know that you serve so many other folks throughout the Valley. It's such an important service, especially for our Valley that's so remote and so rural. Um, you're also excellent advocates. Um, and so whether it's talking to um, one of your community members, primary care physicians, or talking to public health, or getting information to me or anyone else on behalf of the clients that you guys serve, please um, keep that communication open um, and listen up for when we come around to do community health assessments, listening sessions, and interviews. Um, uh, please start thinking about things that, that you'd like to see us prioritize. Great. We will certainly keep our ears open. Thank you for all the good work you're doing in the community. We are certainly grateful for your time today and for uh, all the amazing information that you shared with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.